So let's now analyze in a little bit more detail what is QU actually doing? So we know that that matrix M that we had, it was broken up into two parts. And when we send a message U across a channel, we will keep our original message in one part of that vector, but we'll add a, a bunch of fluff to it. And what is the meaning of that fluff from maybe a more a, a different perspective? Um, it turns out that there's a very interesting sort of uh, logical thing that's going on between the entries of U and what Q is doing to those entries. And the idea is that it's adding those entries in such a way as to maintain the sort of consistency. So if we take actually Q, U, and we apply that matrix Q that was left over, the vector we would get in terms of the entries of U, so U is going to be U1 through U4, the entries of this vector are going to be U1 plus U3 plus U4, U1 plus U2 plus U4, and the third entry, because this is a 3 by 4 matrix, is going to be U1 plus U2 plus U3. And these entries here are called, well, let's call them P1, P2, and P3 for now, and they are called parity bits. And the reason they're called parity bits is because when this message gets sent across a channel, if an error occurs, these entries are summing up the entries of the vector u in some specific way. And if an error occurred, right, we have some vector p1, p2, p3, and then u1, u2, u3, and u4. If an error occurred in one of these entries, then these parity bits will detect if an error occurred and where the error occurred based on the consistency of this formula. So let's see how this works in an explicit example. Let's say we have the vector 0, 0, 1. And I'll break this up into the two different parts so that we isolate the parity bits versus the original message. And by the way, this isn't the original message that I'm writing right now. This is what happens after it's sent. And let's say the receiver sees this message. I believe this may be the example we were working with a moment ago. So let's now look at these formulas and see what they say. So P1 on the one hand equals 0. But let's see if the sum of these entries is also equal to 0. So if we take U1 plus U3 plus U4, we get 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3, which is 1, which is not equal to 1, which equals u1 plus u3 plus u4. What does this mean? This means an error occurred in one of these entries. And when I say one of these entries, I mean either P1, U1, U3, or U4. So let's write that down. P1, U1, U3, or U4. And we know it has to be exactly one because, again, we're assuming at most one error occurred. And because of this inconsistency, we're guaranteed that an error occurred. The only way no error would occur is if all of these would be consistent. So if P1 does equal this, P2 does equal that, P3 does equal that, because this would say that our vector is of this form, m applied to the original vector u. So that doesn't exactly tell us which of the errors it is yet. Is it P1, U1, U3, or U4? So for that, we'll look at the other parity bits. So let's look at P2. The vector we see says P2 is 0. Is that consistent with this formula, U1 plus U2 plus U4? So u1 plus u2 plus u4 is 0. So that actually is consistent. What does this tell us? 
This tells us that no error occurred in any of these entries, because if one error occurred, it is impossible for these two to be equal to each other. So this means P2, U1, U2, and U4 are all error free. Now let's compare this to the first one that we analyzed. The first one said it was possible that the error occurred at U1, and it was also possible that the error occurred at U4. This new observation tells us those two possibilities, it's not possible that an error occurred in those entries. So now the only possibilities left are P1 and maybe U3. So we'll keep that in mind when we go to the last parity bit, which will then isolate exactly where the error occurred. So P3 is equal to, well from this it's 1, and is that equal to U1 plus U2 plus U3? U1 plus U2 plus U3, it's equal to 0. So that's not equal to this, which is U1 plus U2 plus U3. Now this tells us that error is in 1 of P3, U1, U2, or U, th or U3. We already know that U1 and U2 are not possible, right? U1 and U4 are not possible. And the only error that's common to both of these, right, because we know an error, one error occurred in either P1 or P or U3, or it's possible that an error occurred in P3 or U3. But if it was P3, right, suppose that the error occurred in P3, then this would have been fine. It would have been unaltered because we wouldn't have detected an error. U3 would have also been okay. So the only possibility in this case is that an error occurred in U3, the one that's singled out from these three parity bits. So error in U3. And therefore, if we go to this original message, the message that we received, rather, and then we, um, this is, sorry, this is the message we received, what we would have to alter is the U3 entry of this to get back the original message. Therefore, the original message is the last four entries as it was before, but now we alter that third message, that third entry, to get 1001 as the original message being sent. And this is consistent, I believe, with the answer that we obtained earlier. So you might be wondering, okay, this is a little bit more intuitive because we're sort of counting up our different entries in different ways and sort of using a process of elimination method to isolate exactly where the error occurred. Now, of course, that is a little bit more straightforward. It's easier to work with. It's easier to think about um, the first time you see it, perhaps. On the other hand, the linear algebra method, it allows you to see it from a maybe potentially different perspective. And I would think that if you're working with a much, much larger message, that the linear algebra method seems to be a lot easier to work with, especially when you look at the way that we multiply those matrices. And the form of the Hamming matrix that we constructed, so let me just say this, that the CS Hamming matrix um, looks a little bit different. For instance, I think it starts out with um, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, but then the third column is not 0, 0, 1. I think the fourth column is 0, 0, 1, and these other um, four columns are some permutation of the leftover columns I had. And now you can see if you were to manipulate this with the other matrix M that's associated to this one by demanding that the kernel of H equals the image of that matrix M, the algebra would be a little bit more. We can't just break this up into do blocks, identity, and the leftover part. Um, instead, it has sort of this interpretation but I believe the linear algebra calculations are much, much simpler um, if you work with a block, a block matrix um, of the form that I indicated earlier. Now this may change if you try to 
look at what happens if multiple errors occur, um, how would you potentially correct for all of those additional errors, um, and I'll leave you to think about that um, and to check out the literature on that.